All right, welcome uh, everyone to the Northampton Urban Forestry Commission meeting agenda, uh, April 5th, 2023. Um, there are members of the public here um, and Jackie Balance is the first one to have her hand up. Jackie, I don't have any prizes or candy to give you for that. <laughs> but, um, oh. Someday, someday I'll get you something. This, this is better than candy. I just want to give a public thank you to Bonnie and someone named uh, Karen Nelson and Rich for doing what they had to do to put this together so that the public could log in. We've been looking forward to Kent's presentation for a long time, and I can hardly wait. I'm holding my breath. That's it. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Jackie, for your comments. Uh, anyone? Um... Anyone else have any comments, public comment? All right. Um, I just, I just like hot off the press 27 seconds ago, sent you the minutes from the last meeting. That is no one's fault but my own. Bonnie had no hand in that. That was, I just have been out of the office for a couple of days. So, um, so if you want to take the, take your time, take a look at them. Hello, Jordan. Yeah. yeah, not sure who it was. Rich. Yes. Um, it's Molly. Are you going to put that link in the minutes for Professor Rogan's talk? I have I haven't um had a connection with him. Oh. So he he didn't send the link to me and I have just been overwhelmed and I actually would I want to set up a Zoom meeting with him so I can have a conversation about what we talked about at our last meeting and their um his desire or his ability I should say or bandwidth to do a um uh, um an analysis for for the city based on what we saw if he's interested in doing it um so I, I will once i get it i will i actually just i'll email it to you all so you can have it okay sorry oh, molly i'll take that line out of the minutes okay great thank you I'm all done reading. Yeah, I'm done as well. Yep, me too. I'm finished. Rob, are you still reading the minutes? Um, I I wasn't at the last meeting, so I'm um I'm, I'm not going to be voting. I did read them. Yes. Okay. Um, if everyone is completed reading the minutes, can I get a motion to accept the minutes as amended? I will. Okay. There's my uh, there's a motion on floor second, please. Second. 
second by Jen Warner. Uh, discussion on the motion? No discussion. Uh, Bonnie, could you please take a roll call of the commissioners? Absolutely. Rich? Uh, yes. Susan? I think she said yes. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, Molly? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Rob? I'm saying for not being oh, there. Okay, yep, and David? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I have a little bit of a few things to talk to you about. Um, so a couple of things. So I we have uh, National Grid has um, requested a public shade hearing for a 34 inch uh, northern red oak oh. on river on um, River Road. Um, this is um, a utility project uh, where the uh, national grid is um, rerunning the primaries and secondaries that run from uh, Haydenville or Williamsburg to the beginning of um, the old Hampshire County or Highview, I think it's called now. So there are many, many trees on that embankment. Um, if you're driving down River Road and you come around that sharp curve, high views on the left, it goes up a steep hill. You keep going to Haydenville. On the left-hand side, there's an embankment there that's basically made out of ledge. Um, the majority of the trees that they are, that the, all the trees that they are taking down except for two, the oak, and there's like, a, I think it's a six or seven inch hemlock, are all private trees that belong to um, Highview. The two trees that they need to take out that, are, that belong to the city or are public shade trees are the ones we're gonna have a public shade tree hearing for. Um, I haven't set the date yet. I've got to um, try to get that squared away with the Gazette tomorrow. Um, and I will keep you posted on that. They are aware of the mitigation. They are aware of the cost to remove the tree. Um, the problem with the the problem, the, the issue being is that the existing utilities are up on top of the ledge, so they're not accessible. Um, they're, it's considered like what they call a cross country line. So they they installed poles. So this has been a process. They installed new poles. Um, I actually worked with them to identify which trees were public shade trees. And I thought that we had mitigated the trees that, uh, or the trees that were there that needed to be removed were okay to be removed because of their position in the ledge, their condition, um, and they were not very large. And they put the poles in and then their engineering department came back and said that we need to have X, Y, and Z trees removed. So I went back up there a couple of weeks ago with a survey that I found and just spent a few hours walking around um, and determined that there's only two trees that are gonna be impacted that are public shade trees. So. I, I will be honest with you, the very large oak that's there, it is, um, it's got probably a 20 to 30% lean. So, and it's been, it's been, it's been pruned in the past, not by us. I don't know who did it. Um, it's, it is near the existing utility. So my guess is the utility has pruned it, but um, eventually the tree, the, where, where it's rooted, uh, it's at the top of the embankment. So it really only has, um, about 50% of its rooting capacity is in um, as any kind of soil volume of any worth. Mm. So I, it, it potentially could become um, a tree that would, could possibly fail in the future. If that, you know, put your mind at ease, but I, I mean, it doesn't, it's a tree. I don't really want to cut it down, but I don't really see um, any choice. And then of course, grid has the, you know, grid has to follow all the, uh, MGL 87, and we also have to have a public shade tree hearing, so anyone can object at any time, and then that then I would get the mayor involved at that point. But I, I'll keep you posted on that process. That's one thing. Um, let's see. Uh, two two Mondays ago, I attended the Salem Tree Committee meeting in Salem, Mass. I didn't go to Salem; it was on, I did it on Zoom with them. Um, I gave them uh, a PowerPoint presentation of our tree planting initiative. I've been in contact with Darlene Mills and Ray Jordan. Ray is the operations manager for the DPW. Darlene Mills is the chair of their commission. Um, and they, uh, I met Darlene like probably like four years ago at a tree steward training at the Harvard Forest. 
So we sort of kept in contact and she asked if I'd be willing to come and talk to the commission um, just about our activities in Northampton and our initiative and how we've, how we've you know, what we've learned, uh, what we've done, what we did well, what we didn't do well. Um, they have a they have a, a commission similar to ours, but they do not have a volunteer um, group like Tree Northampton. So they rely upon contractors for plantings. They rely upon TBW staff for plantings, and um, that there is they they are just trying to build up programs. So I spent a couple hours with them. So um, and I there was a PowerPoint presentation that I gave um, that Rob and I gave for. These Rob, I don't know how long ago it was, maybe two years ago during the height of the pandemic. Plainville? No, no, we, it was for the uh, Benai Israel congregation. We we did oh, it, yeah. right? So I kind of took that, it had 50 slides. I kind of fixed it up. I put a bunch of new pictures in it. Um, I, I found a whole bunch of old pictures from Village Hill um, when oh. we did a lot of uh, um, uh, volcano mulch removal and uh, root flare issues. So those were... Those were good to uh, to stick in the slides because they have they are one of many communities in Massachusetts, and I'll, I'm trying to make this short as possible. But they are one of many communities in Massachusetts that has applied for grant funding for tree planting through EEA, which is Environmental Energy and Affairs. Huh. Um, and um, basically, the way this works is that because there is tremendous amount of ARPA money available, and also the um, the uh, um, Inflation uh, Reduction and Recovery Act has earmarked millions of dollars for urban tree plantings throughout the country. Massachusetts is the recipient of thousands of dollars for planting. So Salem um, applied for a grant. They were awarded a grant. They worked with a contract. They awarded the tree plantings to a contractor. I'm not sure who the contractor was. They planted probably, I think, like. 70 some odd trees and the uh, i would according to darlene 50 percent of them are planted too deeply so one of my talking points really in the powerpoint was talking about proper tree planting uh volcano mulch etc so um i may go out there at some point and meet with folks in person but i don't i don't really have the time to do it right now but i i think they're looking for some they're looking for some assistance because they don't have um public work staff is at capacity they don't have the ability to i guess put or, or volunteers together um which is unfortunate but i think they're they're trying so the problem is is that in order for salem and other communities that have this issue to get their grant reimbursement the trees have to be um fixed correctly or um dcr who does the inspections for eea will not approve the grants and then the community is out whatever dollars the grant was for because you you know as a municipality you have to front load the money and then you get reimbursed so so there's a lot of that going on can't the, con can't the contractor be held responsible for that so that's a good that's a good question it depends how the contract is written every community writes their contracts a little different so you may have a contingent a contingency where you only pay the contractor, you know, 80% of the value of the contract um, until the contract cycle is over, which means that there's a year left, the contractor has to water the trees, et cetera. Um, I know of another community that did not do that. They pay the contractor $100,000 to plant 207 trees. DCR came back and did a sampling of 60 of those trees. 90% of those 60 were planted too deeply. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, that community paid the contractor up front. But the uh or actually when the work was done, but I believe the contractor and has made a good faith effort to come back with its staff and lift the trees up. So, but it's there's so much money to be um to, available to plant trees that um there are, are not enough trained staff to actually plant them correctly. And that's really what the, the problem is at this point. You have folks that are in the nursery trade. You have folks that are landscapers that um, just don't have the right, that particular skill set. They have a different skill set, but they don't necessarily have the skill set to, you know, and the other thing too in the nursery trade is that when now all of a sudden there's this crush countrywide to find plant material. So now people are going to rely upon 
whatever they can get their hands on, which means container, B and B that's you know been multi multiple times moving from one ministry to another, so it has multiple interchanges. So it's going to be an interesting few years. Um, but um, so that was that was another that was one other thing. Um, I actually gave a presentation this past Monday to the Boston Power Corps students um, at Mount Ida College, um, which was a great presentation. I, I met with about 30 uh, students and they're in, uh, the instructor. Um, again, gave them a similar PowerPoint, uh, like I just gave to Salem to talk about our tree uh, initiative. Um, again, how we've gotten where we are, the, the players, the cooperation, the community cooperation. So um, a lot of uh, those young folks are, are trying to, they're re getting retrained um, and hopefully are going to assimilate back into the city of Boston. But um, I definitely probably could have got a couple of them to ride back with me in the truck. I just wouldn't know how to get them home. Um, you know, but they are, they, they are, they are the future. And I was really, um, um, I don't know, I guess a, for a better word, I felt, I feel very passionate about talking to people in the industry that are just breaking ground and getting in the industry just because maybe I'm seeing the light at the end of my own personal tunnel, like, you know, my age or whatever, but I just feel like it's really important to impart knowledge that we have gained as a commission, as a group, and as arborists uh, to folks that um, need it. So I found I, a lot of satisfaction for me. Um, uh, I got invited to, uh, yes, Jackie, Jacqueline, sorry. Hello, Jacqueline. Hey, sorry about that. Just had trouble unmuting. Rich, that's so awesome. Um, and they're so lucky to, to hear from you. I'm also curious, is that presentation available um, somewhere on the NorthamptonMA.gov website? Or is that something that, um, yeah, residents have access to, the presentation that you've, you've been sharing? Uh, no, I, the presentations, I don't, they are, I, I don't want to say they're proprietary, but they're presentations that I can share with you. I don't typically share them. I do share them with uh, this one. I will share because I gave it away to the students. Okay. Um, but I just, love to. yeah, and it's, not, it's not a problem. I will, I will try to find a way to see if we can get them posted in some place where people can look at them. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. But I'll send it to you individually. Um, Actually, if you could send me an email, that would be great because I'm not sure I have your email address. Great. That's what I'll do. Thank you so much, Rich. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right, cool. Um, I'm also uh, was invited to speak uh, with um, some residents in Cummington, their tree warden, uh, and a couple other tree wardens in the surrounding communities of Cummington. That's tentatively, tentatively going to happen on April 27th. Um, the topic of discussion is uh, utility tree removals and trimming. Um, Cummington, if you remember in the newspaper, has had a little bit of trouble with some removals that uh, um, were not supposed to happen. Apparently, that did happen through some lack of communication between Eversource, the contractor, and the town. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but they invited uh, me and myself, Bob Goss, um, Alan Taylor, and um, the gentleman from um, Worthington, the tree warden, and I can't remember his name at the moment, but I'll, I'll remember eventually, just to try to have a roundtable discussion, because they're interested, Cummington is interested in starting a group sort of like the Plainfield Tree Alliance. So, um, you know, I'm just going to go up there and just hear what they have to say and give them some advice if they are if they want it and if not i'll just listen and, and you know they can get ask questions later but and then last but not least uh mastery warden seedling program we are still hustling seedlings out the door i think we're going to hit thirty thousand. i've got you know so it's been it's been it's been uh it's been good it's been crazy i it's been a crazy spring so but other than that I think that's about it. I think I've said enough. Unless does anyone have any questions? I just I just have a quick comment about um, the when you were talking about the Salem folks that they were 
not planted properly. And, yes. um, you know, that's like an ongoing, it's not just labor shortage. It's just an ongoing problem in our industry. The arborists are certified uh, and all other trades have licensing and certification. We have pesticide applicator certifications, but, um, you know, it's been a, it's been trouble for our industry for a long time. There's just not enough, in my opinion, not enough, uh, you know, accountability that has teeth in it. So, you know, people can slap a, a magnet on the side of their truck and call themselves a landscaper, you know, so. Yeah, and I, and I think that's really where, I mean, the, the, the majority of people that plant trees in this country are not people like ourselves. They're not actually arborists either, actually. Right. They are landscape right. installers. Mm -hmm. are, right. um, you know, day workers, um, seasonal workers, and unfortunately, they are just not given the right tools right. Um, to actually, hmm. you know, plant plant the trees uh, effectively and correctly. I, so I, I, I think it's, and I think the other thing too is that there are so many different, as Jen alluded to, there's so many different standards. So like these, there's the American nurseryman standards, there's the ANSI standards. So you have different groups of people that are very familiar with the particular standards of their industry and they don't necessarily cross over um, and actually um, plant, uh, you know, propagate, they propagate things one way, but planting is to them is, is the same as propagating, you know? So I, I, I think it's a very interesting there. I think there has to be a, um, a bigger dialogue. Um, and I also thought about the American Nurserymen's uh, Association that would be a good place to actually have an uh, an arborist or someone in the municipal world or state level actually be a um, give a presentation about uh, you know tree planting, proper tree planting, working with landscape architects because that's another thing. There's a lot of landscape design that goes on, and the landscape designers are not necessarily boots on the ground. So there's a lot of stuff going on, but I, we're not going to solve it all. But I think. You know, urban forestry has like come light years in the last 15 years. You know, it's like it's it's like somebody slammed on the brakes in a car and I, I have whiplash. Mm. So, um, but anyways. Uh, all right. I've taken up a lot of time. My apologies. Um, anybody has any questions, they can reach out to me later if they'd like. Uh, one other thing we do have, I did schedule. We are having a meeting that's uh, an open meeting here at my office, 930 on Friday. And we can talk about that more, the Arbor Day Earth Day giveaway. It's talk about tree plantings, et cetera. Um, and I, I, we are going to have a quorum, so I wanted to have it an open meeting, but it's in person. So um, I can send you all an invite if you're interested, but I know there's a few of you coming. Um, but I will send out that agenda tomorrow. Um, but I can talk more about it uh, later in the meeting. All right, Kent. All right. Kent, you're up. Kent, thank you again for coming to the meeting and doing this presentation for us and all the hard work you've done to get there. We really appreciate it. Okay, just a minute. Let me find the right window to share here. There it is. All right, can you see that report? Yes. So this this came out of a discussion with Sue, actually, of looking for data sources that might be interested to analyze for land use in Northampton. And I found this National Land Coverage Database. Um, and so just let me introduce the data first. There's this multi-resolution land characteristics consortium, which has a lot of big government agencies involved in it. And they have um, quite a lot of uh, data sources available. Um, on this continental United States, they have in particular land coverage and tree canopy. Um, and the land coverage is the one that I've done. They have land coverage data from every three years from 2001 to 2019. Um, there's also a viewer. If you want to look at this data yourself, um, you don't need any particular data analysis skills to open up this viewer. 
and take a look. So here's a quick look. Um, oops, not Pennsylvania, we want Massachusetts. Uh, so here's Northampton. Um, this is the um, 2019 land cover layer. If you look at the legend, see the, the various shades of red are developed land. The darker it is, the more developed. So you can see the King Street corridor here and uh, Elm Street and um, or Prospect Street going out to Florence Center here. Um, and then there's um, quite a few categories. And there's links to both of these in this in this report. So if you want to explore them yourselves, um, you can. And also, if anybody has the ability to use ArcGIS or QGIS, um, you can download these data sets um, and bring them in their, their georeference TIFF files. So if you do have those skills, they're pretty easy to bring into your own um, your own analysis program. So this data is land cover at 30 meter resolution. So every square on here is a 30 meter square. That's pretty big. That's about 100 feet. My house lot is 100 feet frontage and 50 feet deep. So one of these squares is probably my house lot plus across the street to the yard, into the yard across the street. So it's, it's fairly coarse. Um, also, the most recent data is 2019, so it's not as up to date as might be nice. They are planning to release 2022 data sometime. I think they told me the first half of this year, so we'll see. Anyway, I took this data. It's 30 meter resolution. There's 16 categories. Let me just show you quickly. Um, oops. These are the 16 classes. That's too much really to make an interesting analysis. So I, I aggregated them into these six classes. And again, this is in my report. So you can look for, look at details. And there's a link here for the detailed definitions. Like if you wanna know what's the difference between shrub, scrub, and herbaceous, you have to go and look at the definition. These are not my, my categories and my definitions. So with that said, let me get into the actual analysis. Um, first of all, just looking at um, total coverage. So Northampton is about 47% forested, 26 to 27% developed, 15% uh, wetland or water, 11% cultivated, tiny, tiny bits of herbaceous shrub and other. It changes, forest has gone down. So I should say there's one possible confusion in this table that these percentages here are the percentage of the total for the city. So forest is 47%. These percentages are the changes between 2001 and 2019. So forest coverage has gone down by 2%. Developed coverage has gone up by 3%. Cultivated is down. Spacious and shrub is up by a large amount, but it's so few acres that that um, doesn't amount to very much. Um, and I should say, feel free to interrupt with questions. I don't actually know which parts of this might be most interesting to people. So if you have questions or um, anything that you think would be interesting for uh, further development, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. So the next thing I looked at was the change in the land cover. And this is showing now for each of the three year periods, just the change, so starting with a zero baseline in 2001, and you can see the um, change in developed coverage is up by about 208 acres. Change in forested coverage is down by about 180 acres. Um, there's also an uh, increase in herbaceous and shrub coverage and a decrease in cultivated coverage. Um, these changes, you can get the wrong impression here. It sort of looks like the forested land is going to develop and the cultivated land is going to herbaceous, but that's actually, um, it's a little more complicated than that. So this chart here shows like for just the changed acreages, what was it in 2001 and what did it become in 2019? So the forested land, a lot of it went to develop, but some of it has turned, gone back to herbaceous. The cultivated, fair amount of cultivated land became developed a little bit of cultivated land has gone back to forest. Some of the herbaceous has turned to forest. 
So this gives you a little bit more nuanced um, view of, of these changes. It's not just forest becoming cultivated and uh, cultiv or forest becoming developed and um, cultivated becoming herbaceous. It, there, it's a little bit of a split. Um, so I don't know if there's questions. Am I going too fast? I don't want to um, rush over this too much. Okay, no, so the, you're fun. Okay, good. So then this table, this is the numbers that underlie this. So of the things that were categorized as forest in 2001 that changed, 137 acres went to developed, 62 acres went to herbaceous and shrub. So that's, this is the 137 acres. This is the 62 acres, a little bit, eight acres went to cultivated. You can see that down here. Similarly, the cultivated mostly went to developed, but 14 acres has gone back to forest. Herbaceous shrub, some went to develop, some went back to forest. So this table here just gives the numbers that underlie this, this flow chart. So if you want to know exactly how many acres one of these lines represents, you can get that out of this table. Yeah. And then finally, there's a map. So this shows now. This is more limited. This is showing everything that used to be forest in 2001, which is not forest in 2019. And it's colored by what it's gone to. So most of it's developed. And this is um, zoomable, so you can come in here mm -hmm. and see. And it's, I think, probably not too surprising. You can see um, this is uh, Emerson Way and the two co-housings and Ice Pond Drive, for example which were um, forested in 2001, and they're now being shown as, as developed. Um, there's uh, over here, here's some forested land, which is devolved back to herbaceous. This is in the, um, uh, I forget the name of this, this brook along here. It's south of Burt's Pit Road, a Parsons, this is Parsons Brook area. There's been some forest that's going back to herbaceous. Um, you can also change the base map. This, basic map is uh, stays out of the way, but if you want more detail, you can change it to an open street map and see what's in there. So actually this is the Northampton Solar and uh -huh. not sure why that's showing as shrub when it's solar. I think panels. it's now, I think it's solar panels. It might be now because it yeah. is actually 2000, maybe they had cleared it in 2019. Yeah. Um, there's also a satellite view, so you can look there. And I don't know what the date of this satellite view is, um, but yeah, it's showing that as cleared land. So this lets you kind of do a couple of different ways of exploring. Um, and uh, you can see also there's some individual places, which are presumably individual houses, which were put in or um, maybe that were cleared around them. I don't, I don't know the details of of what happened in these individual spots, but presumably there was a house that was added to this development or something like that. Um, so that's sort of the overview. Is, all, is that all clear so far? Because now I'm gonna sort of repeat. Um, there was, I think it was Rich who asked me to divide, to divide this up by zoning category. So um, these five categories are from Rich, they, they consolidate the individual zones. Um, so the rural, and I'm sorry, I don't know what these zones stand for. I was, I was trying to add that in today, but um, so the, just the zoning codes. And it repeats the same tables, but only for um, squares, land cover within the particular zones. So this is what happened in the rural zones. It's pretty much the same story. There's a loss of forest increase in developed land. Um, some loss, a little bit of loss of wetland, which is, I don't know what happened to that, but, um, and some gain in herbaceous. So actually you can look at the wetland. So this looks like some wetland progression, maybe where it's turning into herbaceous and shrub. Uh, so these are all the same, exactly the same types of charts and tables that I went through with for the whole city, but they're showing now only rural zones and the map. Um, also with the rural zones. And there's also now an overlay. So if you wanna know where are these rural zones, you can turn this overlay on and off. And uh, one thing that's a little funny about this that I wanna point out, because you'll probably see it, 
some of these like spaces like Rocky Hill is actually split between rural and suburban zoning. So if you look at the rural zone, it's around the houses and, and between the houses and the roads, but the houses themselves and the roadways are not zoned rural. So it's this, kind of this funny thing where the forest loss then, since I'm just showing forest loss in uh, rural in this map, it gets kind of split up. But if we come through to these tabs, we can look at the suburban, uh, and now it's changing to show the same thing in suburban. I don't think there's huge differences between these, um, but you can come down and see that those houses are um, zone suburban. Um, and that repeats for the urban residential, business industrial, central business district. I didn't do the tables and maps because there's actually no change. It's all urban in the central business zones. There's no, um, there's nothing that's not classified as some sort of uh, developed rather. Um, so this, if you want to know how I aggregated, you can look here. And then I thought if you're not probably familiar with the zoning, which I'm certainly not, I put together this little map just showing the actual zones and the pop-up shows what I aggregated it to, and then the actual zoning class from the uh, from the, the city zoning. Um, so that's the report. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or if people have suggestions of what might be interesting to add, I'm, I'm interested in that as well. That was pretty quick. So if, there, if there's anybody that you want me to explain in more detail, also I'm happy to do that. I have a question about the, um, the, what, the forested land. If you lived in a neighborhood that had a lot of big old trees, um, would that, could that potentially be interpreted as forest by the, however they collected the data or, or not? Um, yeah, I guess we could go and look at the viewer. Is there a particular neighborhood you're thinking of that you are interested in? Um, no, um, not off the top of my head. I was just wondering I guess it could be considered urban forested. I guess I'm trying to get my head around yeah, what this, forested means. It's So this is, again, it's 30 meter resolution. So 30 meter squares, which are big. And it's the primary category in that 30 meters. So if you're in an urban area with some big trees, but also streets and parking lots and buildings, it's probably going to show up as um, one of these developed. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. I don't know what happened here. This so I mean all of downtown is urban. Mm -hmm. All of the King Street corridor is urban. This neighborhood up here is entirely urban. This neighborhood I live, you know, in this round hill neighborhood, it's almost entirely urban. There's probably would tend to show up more as developed open space. So like up in here, these are, you know, people's lawns and trees that they are fully developed. It's not forested land. Got you. Okay. But it's showing up as, as developed open space. And yeah. um, and then Child's Park looks significantly different there. Child's Park is showing yeah. us mostly okay. forested. And there okay, that, that I, I. And parking lots in there. Yeah, that helps me understand. This is the best way to explore. Um, if you really want to get a better idea of the overall, you know, how is the city classified? Um, and also you can you can look to some extent at changes because you can, um, you know, if you put this to fully opaque, you can select multiple layers. So I can select 2001. It's a little funky, but you can blink layers on and off. If you know how to use QGIS or ArcGIS, that's a better way to view this data because it's more responsive. And you get you can get better control of transparency and things, but for just a basic, you know, what is this showing me? This this viewer is a pretty good place to start. Uh, Jackie, Jackie Balance. Yeah, um, we're back where you showed us 
the changes that were in the rural neighborhood that urban residential was a choice yeah could you show us the urban residential changes sure. over so this here, period of time it's a little different because there's no basically no cultivated or herbaceous land in this so in this case all the forested land that was lost has pretty much gone to develop a little bit of increase in other which I'm not sure the other there's hardly anything in the other class but maybe barren or unclassified I'm not sure what went into there well, we Thank can look you. at the map actually. So here's the map, and we have to try to try to find the other. Oh, this is not being very friendly. I don't know why it's zooming funny. Oops. No. I... All right. I seem to be having some network problems all of a sudden. Um, Well, you should be able to look at this map and uh, see for yourself where the changes are. And also it will show up the uh, what's gone into other. Um, maybe let me just refresh this page and see if that helps. Yeah. Sometimes when you're sharing on Zoom, I've noticed that things don't yeah, it's load like properly when they're being shared always. Chewing up my uh, my bandwidth maybe. Let's see if this is better. Uh, let's turn off the zone. It's this. So now we want to try to find something that's blinking gray, and it's only going to be, well, one acre. So I don't think we're going to find that. There's there's one acre that went from forest to other, and that's um, going to be hard to find in here. So it seems generally like the big areas, the big red blotches are these multi-house developments in previously truly forested parts of the city. Mostly, yeah. That's I mean, where most of like are. This is a development behind the high school. I'm not really sure what happened there, but it, there was some kind of expansion, I guess, behind, or no, that behind the technical school. Um, so it's not entirely, but yes, most of them. Those are parking lots for the hospital. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and really, if you go to the, uh, the, the map that shows all the zones, it's a little better, better but I think you'll recognize most of them. Um, I'm not sure. This one is, this is the co-housing up at Village Hill. Uh, and I probably some additional expansion at Village Hill. Yeah. Um, Ice Pond Drive and the co-housing. This is the jail, I think, down here. Was there an expansion of the jail? Oh, no, it's Dunphy Drive. I guess the end of Dunphy yep. Drive. That was by right construction, yeah. Um, some building along Cardinal Way. So, yeah, the, the isolated ones are presumably uh, individual houses that were added. And then the ones that have gone to something other than developed, um, I'm not probably familiar enough with that, but West Hampton Road. this looks like maybe it was cleared for development, but yeah. not actually developed yet. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, there's there's houses up there now. So in 2019, yeah. it was it was cleared. This one down here looks like maybe the same thing. Yeah, where there are houses there now. Um, Rich, do you know? What's that? Where, okay. where, where is that? Glendale Road? Off of Glendale Road. Yep, that's actually, uh, that's the Habitat property and that's where like wagon trails. Yeah. Where the dog park was going to be. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kent, I, a couple of people from the public, uh, Jacqueline. Oh, yeah, sure. Kent. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's all good. This is all great information. This is great. This is terrific. Yeah, this is awesome, Ken. Thank you so much for showing us this. Um, I don't know if it was a month or two ago, I attended a, a Zoom presentation by Bob Leverett, um, and he was really emphasizing, and all of his colleagues uh, emphasize the fact that we can't plant our way out of the climate crisis, and that um, that trees that are between the ages of 35 to 200 years old are the trees that sequester the most carbon and produce the most oxygen and provide the most wildlife habitat. 
and um, Jackie Balance and other other residents and I are, you know, really trying to talk to city councilors, um, Carolyn Mish and the mayor about, Rich, you kind of mentioned you are um, uses by right. So in 2013, when the city council passed URB uses by right and zero lot line, which then became reduced lot line in 2021, kind of what those effects are having. Um, on these trees that are so important for, um, you know, livability. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, so how can we use this data? I know it's not totally up to date, but it's giving us a good, a pretty good picture over like a 20 year span. Um, how, what, what are some takeaways that you're seeing that can help us in giving folks who are in charge in the city a big picture of development versus, you know, keeping these trees that are really important to, um, to you know, staying alive <laughs> and that kind of thing. Well, the just the raw acreage of lost forests is probably the best indication of that from this data. Uh, 181 acres approximately have been lost um, to forested land in these uh, 18 years. Okay. There is there's another data set which unfortunately is not that it's not there's a tree canopy data set which has only been updated in 2016, and I'm hoping that they'll come out with a 2021 or 2022 version of that. And this one actually shows uh, tree coverage by percent. So it's not just, is this 30 meter square majority forested, but it's what percentage of the 30 meter square is tree coverage. So I think that could be really helpful if it was more up to date. I think looking at 2016 data is probably not that helpful. Um, that that just, would probably maybe give a little bit more uh, nuanced view of, where, of what the canopy loss is. This one, it's a, this is a fairly crude measure, unfortunately. Okay. I think this thank dovetails you. nicely with, um, and thank you, Jacqueline, for asking that. Um, it dovetails nicely with the presentation we had on heat islands at la the last meeting and the percentage of canopy you need to start reversing the heat island effect, I, was it 37? So for instance, we could use this data and look at the heat islands, much in the vein of what Molly's been working on, looking at how to in, increase the downtown tree canopy. Um, oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, I know on April 10th, um, I think it's Legislative Matters is having a meeting and, the planning board is already very gung ho about um, including uses by right, reduced lot line for multifamilies. They already have that for uh, single families, and I've been wondering if, if you know, this just goes hog wild. What kind of, you know, multifamilies are going to be larger than single families, and. Um, if we don't have greater tree protections and you're able to have these reduced lot lines so you don't have as much setbacks and you've got uses by right so you can take down you know any tree that you want to basically if if that's happening on a large scale what kind of heat island effect can be created um by adding multifamilies to uses by right reduced lot line and uh so yeah that's Great that you're talking. Jack, Jacqueline is is are those um uh those um housing um you know the housing um redos on changing lot lines and things like that are those also connected to um, energy efficiency requirements? That might be the case um, with with non single family homes like these multi families they might have to um 
Jackie, I don't know if you know, but um, they might have to meet certain energy efficiency requirements and fossil fuel things, but I fossil fuel free, you know, HVAC systems, but I'm not sure the city has implemented that yet. I mean, and there might be some sort of like a state, like state guidelines and regulations that I'm not sure if we can tamper with those and go above and beyond or not. Um, yeah, I, to be honest, I don't know. Do you know, have a better feeling? Uh, I like, don't, but my thinking here is um, uh, that, uh, you know, much of the push now, you know, would be to have, you know, zero emission buildings, which is fantastic. I'm not against that, but if you are also filling up the lots and what is going to be a primary source probably is solar. So it puts even more pressure on the tree canopy. So it's just something for folks who are doing activist work or kind of watching what the city's doing is to kind of just keep that in the back of your mind would be my suggestion. Um, because it's not just yeah, it's going to be, there's going to be no incentive. There's going to be no place to put trees because then these buildings can't be solarized. Solar. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I wrote an, uh, an email to Carolyn and to George Kohat and, um, oh, I forget, somebody else on the planning board and um, saying like, maybe there will need to be a time sooner rather than later where, where the city says, okay, if we if we want all this solar, it's going to have to be some really large number of kilowatts in order to justify taking down trees. Because I guess I was at a hearing where the habitat I don't know if it was Glendale Road or where they're putting it, but they there are these trees in the front of the property which don't count as public shade trees, and those are coming down. Um, I guess some of them are not in great condition, and I think they're going to plant six trees um, to replace those but in the back in the south of the property if I understood correctly they're gonna like top off a whole bunch of trees and like leave the stags as and I don't know if I have my vocabulary correct or not but leave that for habitat but basically like chop off a whole lot of the canopy so that there can be sunlight to get to the panels so they're not shaded and not working as effectively. So it's like, you know, there was somebody on the planning board who was kind of speaking up for the trees and trying to figure out what the cost, what the trade-off was, you know, of doing that. And I think that um, I, I feel like the whole picture is not really being taken into consideration, especially after hearing Bob Leverett's presentation saying, you know, we can't plant our way out of this and this climate crisis and um, these 35 to 200 year old trees are our saviors. So um, yeah, I, I so appreciate the whole heat island conversation and, and this conversation because I feel like the planning board's not really taking all of this into consideration, but maybe they are and it's just my perspective, but yeah. I'll stop talking. Thank you. Uh, we got a couple other people with their hands up. Uh, thank you for being patient. Uh, I'm going to take them in order. Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi everyone. Um, so I really agree with everything that Jacqueline said. Um, and I think it's really important that we, um, everyone, not just the city, but you know, the, nationally, we incentivize solar development on already just you know on rooftops and already disturbed property and stop cutting down forests i just think that it's not necessary i mean that's not what i raised my hand to say but i didn't even know about this other development and it's just so upsetting i mean we're doing this you know we're just cutting down forests um without thinking about the you know just because these solar companies have incentives to build on in forests and to cut down forests and there's not the ins the same incentives don't exist for um property that's already developed on rooftops and in homes etc so but what i raise my hand to say is that i wonder if um you you 
the data you're presenting, it's, it's fantastic. This must have taken a lot of time. I mean, you presented in a short time, but I can imagine the time you put into doing this report. It's incredible. Um, and I wonder if you can look at smaller periods of time, because this shows what happened over 20 years. But can you look at what's happened, you know, say from 2016 to 2019, and then when the data is available from 2019, you know, so because there, it seems to me that there's probably trends in, in a lot more development and there's probably a lot more, maybe I'm guessing that more of the tree loss, the forest loss might have happened more recently, but I don't really know that. I'm just mm -hmm. guessing. Yeah, you, can, you can see that in this chart because this is showing the change over the over time. Mm -hmm. And it's been pretty steady, actually. Mm. There's a little bit of a bump between 2013 and 2016. Um, but there's there's not a dramatic a year where it's dramatically different. And we don't know what's gone on in the last three years. Um, I mean, I live on Emerson Way, so I know that that whole area was forested and, you know, and now it's not. Yeah. And that was and that was mostly in the last few years. 2019 is the light, most recent data available right. from this source anyway. Hopefully they'll have 2022 data available. Um, well, first half of this year is what they told me uh, late last year. So <laughs> I can certainly update this when new data is available. Uh, another question, uh, uh, Carol. Are you all? I'm sorry, Carol. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I yes, I'm. I'm done. Thank you. You're very welcome, uh, Diane. Diane Scott. Diane Scott has her hand up. Not sure. She's muted. She's muted. And her cardinal is not moving, so I'm not. All right. Well, we. I, I suppose we could come back if she. Uh... Does uh Does anyone else have questions from the commission? For Kent. Kent, I, I don't really have a question, but just a huge thank you for getting this in motion and so we have a baseline and we can that you that can be added to it's wonderful much appreciated Welcome. yeah it's one project and i'll i'll put the link in the chat as soon as i stop sharing i don't think i can do that while i'm sharing but you're welcome to look at this on your own kent uh just send me the link in an email the chat's disabled oh okay yeah. Um, thank you, Kent. Um, fantastic information. Um, I, I it's uh, sort of mind boggling uh, how you put all that together. You kind of I sat there with Kent for uh, like, a, I don't know, 40 minutes or whatever. And Kent's just rattling off all this really cool information. And I'm like, totally like, I feel like I was I, I I no offense, Kent, but I had a headache. It wasn't actually it has anything to do to you. It's just the only the ability for all this information that and the way yeah. that you can distill it uh into a um a report that we can actually view um and ascertain some really good information. So I hope the new data for um from 19 to 22 comes out. Um so we could actually it would be really inter interesting to see. That data change from basically uh, the pandemic until present, uh, because of the um, amount of building that's been happening, a lot of it by right construction. Um, so it would be really, it would be really interesting. Um, Kent, Kent also has been working on our tree planting data um, and our uh, planting location data um, that Molly and uh, the other commissioners put together. Um, Kent, I just want to tell you, Karen has distilled all the data from TreeKeeper and she is has it I think ready to be delivered to you so she's going to send you an email with it okay um so hopefully we can do a, a little com, uh, a, com, a species com, species condition or species comparison a genus and species comparison also I asked her to send you the uh, 2000 planting locations and I, my, my question for you is that would it be possible for you to distill the data of where we've planted trees um, and 
against what Davy recommended locations we planted them. It would be interesting to see um, because we we have used the planting location in Tree Keeper, but we haven't used the tree planting location in Tree Keeper. We've done a lot of work uh, on our uh, on our own. So um, so she's supposed to have that package sent to you. I hope shortly. And then if you wouldn't mind coming back to another meeting um, at some point to go over that data, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I also have the report that I put together on the priority areas. Right. Um, yes, I mean, I, I would, that might be something that um, I me mean, want to, we'll do that in a separate meeting. Maybe I can just chat yeah. offline to try to figure out a good time to do that. Or, or, uh, one. So let me want to add one thing about the report. I'm happy for people to share the link when they get it. Um, if you do want to like copy pieces out of it and send them on, please give attribution. Um, I, as you noted, I put a lot of time into this and I, I like to get credit. Um, so that's all. Feel free to feel free to share. Um, if you're going to share the whole report, just share the link. And if you want to share pieces, please. Um, Give me attribution. Thank you. Thank you. Can Thank I just you. add as form of reverse introduction to Kent that um, Kent has done a lot of this work um, back in Cambridge where he used to live. And um, those reports that he have done that he's done are available on is it Green Cambridge? And you can see he's done a lot of work for trees. So we're so pleased that you're helping us now. Um, following up on that, um, the data that Kent analyzed about the priority plantings, like um, that was about when Lily and I and who was the other person? Marilyn. Together. Marilyn, yeah. yeah. Yep. And the three of us got together and, and figured out where what areas in the city were most priorities to plant in that's what ken has kent has now analyzed did we actually like priority plant in those areas compared to other areas and that is going to his data presentation on that is going to need to be followed up by a discussion by us about like did we meet our goals or how do we actually measure those goals um you know we didn't say what are our specific goal was as far as priority like does that mean 80 percent of the trees are planted in the priority areas or 60 percent or 50 percent or what so it'll it'll lead to some discussion i have a question on that molly remind me what was the data you used to make those priorities was it anecdotal or was there some kind of data you used well no we didn't use data to decide what the priority should be. We just thought like in terms of what are the kind of areas that we want to have be priority areas, for example. Oh, like gateways. Yeah, gateways, social justice communities, places where there's a lot of pedestrians, um, places near gathering places, you know, like um, schools or whatever, um, a whole category of things like that. Uh, cut through streets, you know, a lot of different there were a lot of different priorities that he that we had set that Kent has analyzed now. It's amazing. Great. Yes, it is amazing. So it's uh my skill set um doesn't allow me to be able to do any of that. So I thank Kent a thousand times over. <laughs> um, and it's nice actually I, I think it's nice to see um where we started uh, in 2000, I guess, 16 to where we are today about our priority planting areas. And again, I agree with Molly, if we you know, have what, what, you know, have we met the goals that we set out for ourselves and, you know, what percentage, how far are we, um, have we exceeded the goals that we set out for ourselves in those priority planting locations? You know, that's, that's all gonna be really, uh, really interesting information. So looking forward to that presentation. Um, all right, uh, it is 538, so we're way over, but this is really good. Uh, we have another meeting before Arbor Day, so we have a, we will have a chance to tweak our whatever we need to tweak before Arbor Day, but 
Um, next agenda is Ar Arbor uh, Earth Day tree planting slash whip giveaway. So um, I just wanted to, I, I did mention earlier that we, we do have a, a meeting on Friday here at Spring Grove, um, and that's mainly to discuss um, the upcoming tree planting um, this season. It's also to discuss, um, I'm going to be on vacation for a week and a half during planting season. It's also to sort of try to figure out how we're going to coordinate the plant material stock that we have here, how it's going to get in the field, who's going to do it, you know, et cetera. Um, and it's also to unfortunately discuss the departure of our longtime commissioner, Rob Postal. Because hmm. Rob is, you see Rob sitting in an easy chair right there. It sort of looks like it's like, a, like Rob is really finally maybe going to retire now. I'm not sure. Um, or, or should I just say cutting back? Excuse me. It's, it's definitely at least temporary retirement from the trees up there in Maine. I'm just uh, not working on trees right now. I thought I would be, but I went the whole winter without pruning except one day in Northampton. Mm. So we are, um, so with Rob's absence, um, we, we've had other folks step up from the commission and other folks step up from Tree Northampton. Um, and we, to try to uh, fill uh, the void, but also we sort of have to create a little bit of a framework to better understand what expectations, um, you know, what expectations we have of each other and how we're gonna get there, meaning myself, the, the um, True Northampton folks um, and vice versa. So we can sort of kind of move forward because I'll be honest with you, I, you know, I, at the end of my presentation the other day, I told these kids at the power crisis, you see that award right there that I got as a tree warden in a year, that award, I'm gonna unscrew that nameplate off of there and put another nameplate on there that has everybody's name on it that got us to where we were to, today or at that time frame, because I'm just one person, you know, and I'd have to say I I would I could not have done anything in the field. I couldn't have done the locations, tree selection, um, the the uh, the talking to residents, the setback locations, um, uh, just putting thoughts in my head. I mean, Rob, you have done a tremendous, tremendous amount of work. It, it was a full-time job. Thank you for recognizing that. It was a, it yeah. was a huge job. And I grew into it and thought it was so much fun to learn uh, from you and all and other people who volunteered. You were like Bob Goss and um, Andrew Putnam and a whole bunch. Of, you know, it was really a, a fantastically group, group, fantastic group effort. And it's, I just want to say it takes a lot, which is, it takes a lot to have a program as good as the one that you, Rich, and we developed. It takes a lot of energy. Um, it it, su it surprises me because if you just had a field and you wanted to plant 2,000 trees, you could get someone with a tractor and be done pretty quickly, you know. But but to find all the setback locations and talk to everybody and, and uh, teach everybody how to plant trees and it's a huge, huge undertaking. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember when Rob went in front of the city council many moons ago to get approval to get waive the trench permit fee so he could plant trees in and around his neighborhood um, for residents that wanted trees planted. And, it, you know, I was like, who, who is this Rob guy? Yeah. I was the highway superintendent. I was not the tree warden. I'm like, who is this Rob guy? So I met Rob and um, I was like, wow, this, this is really this is really cool. This is really great. I, I you know. This is awesome. Like, yeah, I can help them out as much as I can. And then, you know, here we are 10 years, I would say 10 or 11 years later, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, 11, yeah. You know, we are we are pushing 2,200 trees planted. Um, we we are all over the map. We are all literally all over the map in Massachusetts. You know, I'm I'm the I I'm, I I know I'm all over the place. I meet a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people. I give a lot of presentations about our program. And I mean, um, Salem was like, where do we, how do we get volunteers like Northampton? Can Northampton send us some volunteers? You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. And I have to say this grassroots effort by people on this commission, by other people that are former commissioners, other volunteers, um, 
and and the partnership between all of those folks and the city to actually make this happen has been pretty incredible. And Rob, you've been like the backbone. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, for recognizing that. And uh, I'm, I'm, it was just a really great thing for me to, to do. It, it, it made every day better when I hear, live, and I loved living in Northampton and being with all the trees. I and mean, the trees did a lot of it, but also all the people. I want to add in Rob is um, often pretty quiet at commission meetings while a lot of discussions happen. Um, but of course, you've also com contributed a lot to the discussions, especially really the technical end of how it really works. But um, I, I want everyone to know and put it on the record that Rob has knocked literally on thousands of doors in the city. I got involved when he started coming up my street. He has a kind of, uh, he worked out a whole way of sort of knocking on the doors of the people who garden because you're going to find some allies there. Yeah. Just a you know, number of tips Rob has shared with us over the years of how to talk to the public yeah. and how to listen and really listen to what they care about in trying to figure out and matching up. Um, and he really had was uniquely positioned because of the amount of time he put in. He knew in his mind, you know, what species might be available at, at Amherst Nursery or in the tree yard of this, the city tree yard and try to match what people cared about on a very, you know, human level. Whereas you can't just kind of dictate to people in communities, you're, you're going to get some trees and this is what kind, because we know best. He really had, he really worked with people. Sometimes he called it, called it sales, but it was really just. just like a used it, car salesman. Yeah. <laughs> I got one for you. You're going to love this one. It's going to take you miles, you know. Because we are trying to promote these, you know, climate migration trees and right. species diversity and things that, and certainly when I first started, everybody just wanted a sugar maple. Yeah. And it could be really daunting. And Rob just persevered year after year, door after door, person after person, listening and talking and spreading the word and helping them understand the priorities. So just an enormous thanks. Volunteer projects often have that one person who quietly just works even seven days a week, Rob would work. It was just tremendous. And we thank you so much. You have a huge legacy here in Northampton. Well, I'll be back to look at the trees for sure. And to say hello to you guys, but also I will be back to visit the trees. Hopefully they're going to grow on many of them, hopefully. Are you 100% moved away to Maine now? So I'm actually here in Northampton uh, packing the house because oh. my wife and daughter moved to Maine. And I still here because I have to pack up. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, it's a pretty big job packing up. We'll let you come back and volunteer every once in a while if you want to. I, I, I will, especially the pruning part, I think. <laughs> because Great. Rob, Rob, you might need some training because you're kind of out of practice. It, <laughs> you, do, you do get rusty. You know, you do. Absolutely. Mm. And I, I just want uh, I want to acknowledge Rich Parrish who has uh, applied to uh, fill the vacant vacancy we have uh, presently. Um, but uh, Rich, I, I just want to let you know that, you know, Rob, there's a lot of shoes to fill there with Rob. So you, you can jump in and you've jumped in. I, I would, Rich and, and Wendy, um, Wendy Parrish have done a fantastic job um, with Jen, Jay Gerard and other Tree Northampton volunteers to do a tremendous amount of pruning this winter. And I hmm. want to say thank you. Um, and acknowledge all the hard work that they've done. Uh, and again, I was sort of like Rob myself this winter. I was not able to really get out and prune with them, which is unfortunate. I'm not going to make that mistake again. But um, but thank you very much. Yeah, I've noticed the pruning. Yeah. Yes, there's a huge pile of brush um, at the wood waste facility um, just waiting for um, to, some decay to happen. <laughs> so. Uh, Yes, Molly. So do we still need to get another counselor to replace Rob, though? 
Yes, we will. Okay. Yep. Because we already have a vacancy that Rich is filling, but we'll have another one when Rob goes. That's correct. So all of you in the audience, think yes. about it. Thank you. Um, okay, our, uh, our Earth Day planting tree whip giveaway. Sue, could you give us a quick, you mind Sue? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Give us a little update with uh, the Rotary Club and where we're at with that. I'm happy to. Barbara Devlin, um, once again, is partnering with us. She is the, she is one of the Rotary Club members. She worked with us last year. She's just stepped in again and provided a lot of communication with the schools, with the Leeds Elementary School, and um, was willing to take on being the funnel for all the volunteers so that we didn't have groups signing up with the school and a group signing up with Rotary and a group signing up in other ways. So she's been funneling them together. And let's see, she has, um, oops, I can't, one, two, three. She has, uh, oh, you muted it again. I think it was a technical. Okay. There we go. Yeah, it says something about the host. Um, she has about 30 volunteers. Um, we're going to be at Leeds School. Um, I don't know how many leaders we have yet. I need to um, talk to Vicki again, but anyone on this call who's who has experience planting, we need you. Um, so Molly, Jen, David, on the 22nd, and of course, Rich Parrish, and um, Rob, of course, you're welcome. The 22nd, we're going to be at Leeds School. And then um, further along, then we're also going to do the 28th and the 29th, the whip giveaways. And Barbara has found some people for that. So Barbara's been coordinating with the school, making sure we're on the calendar and we have permission and the proper paperwork is filled out for getting that really for the volunteers to be on school property. And um, they do a lot of publicity. She's got a press release. Um, I started a press release for the city. I'll get that version to Rich so he can run it by Donna. And we, and of course it has to go through the mayor before that can go out just to announce what we're doing this year. So Earth Day is the 22nd and then 28th and 29th is our celebration of Arbor Day with a true Arbor Day being on the 28th the Friday. We'll be downtown with the whips, giving them away. Um, am I missing anything? Jen? I think we're going to have uh, like an overflow volunteer planting along with lead school. Is that correct? Okay. Where is that? Village Hill to replace right. their like uh, succession for the ash trees. Okay. So uh, we dig safe all those and, or I, we marked them and sent them to, um, um, boy, okay. Sent so we'll them. No, like, how many of rotary people should go there and that sort of logistical thing yeah We're, we could talk we can maybe friday we can drill into some yeah. of the details yeah because the friday meeting definitely will be figuring out you know the spring planting yeah. and then um as well as these other issues without rob being the linchpin you know really holding everything together how we're going to get start working on fall planning and mm -hmm. siting and dig saving mm -hmm. and all of this mm -hmm. but um yeah alicia all those all the dig <laughs> tapes were marked and all alicia's on that i think she did them all. i understand spring is ready to go i i i don't know you'd have to ask alicia. I, alicia and i laid out most of the spring yeah yeah thank you I think we have to recheck some of the places we've been oh, out. We all have to recheck them. I mean, we just match yeah. trees and where they're yeah. coming from. Correct. Yes. So that we have a list of what, and then, yeah. So and Friday, we'll we'll get one way from done, but yeah. But we've often, been. and so we have what are, we have dig safe lists that can be mm -hmm. can be handed to to you, really, Jen and Christine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I've secured the stock, the bare root stock from Chestnut Ridge, uh, and I'm working with John um, at the moment to uh, 
secure the stock from Amherst Nursery. Um, and the way we're going to do Amherst Nursery this year is we're going to use the state combines contract. So I'm not going to put out a RFQ like I've done in the past. You just use combines. You can procure because they already have a contract with the state. So I, the Rob, the list that you sent me, um, I'm sending that. I'm in the process of sending that to John. He's going to actually fill out the cost of each of the trees, and then we will do a what they call a vendor cover sheet, and then we just purchase them. So I, I did just send you a, a, a link to a Google Doc that has the same. Tree. I know. I, I had. I'm sorry, Rob. I had to go. I had to do an end around on you. I had to call Alicia. I couldn't wait. Any oh, longer, man. it's much better to get it from Alicia because when you get it from me, it might be the wrong year. <laughs> or something. I, I'm the worst secretary of all time. And then, so we've got the we've got a lot of partners again, and it's wonderful. And David yeah. gets credit for like really getting the school yes. partnerships going. Thank yes. you, thank, thank you, David. Yeah. And um, we also have maybe high school kids who are going to prepare the seedlings for the Arbor Day. Yes, uh, I just need to know what day they're coming in, and I'll re. I have uh, two science teachers set up. Thanks to David, who coordinate us meeting with them for another thing. But then I brought that up. So they're going to, um, and I'll have to talk. We can talk on Friday, Rich, about that too, okay. about getting yeah. the compost and all that stuff. So I can just take it all up to the high school. Yep. So they're, they're very excited about, they have, um, yeah, about getting the students involved. So they'll bag them all up. Perfect. We'll have handouts, of course. Yep. Devorah Levy has been, um, we were we were in the past just using Missouri Botanical Garden, but she's she actually did a bunch of research and made sure that we had um, location specific better directions for Arbor Day and tree facts than awesome. we've had in the past because we were using another region's website and she found some discrepancies and and, and worked on those. So we're onward and upward. I'll let you, Rich, back to you. Yeah, no, it's all good. Great information. Um, it would be not Sue, thank you for this uh, press release. David, thank you for partnering with the schools. Jen, thanks for taking up the mantle of uh, getting the dig safes done and the siting of the location. Molly, thank you for uh, everything. Uh, as usual, our, our chief data collector and bottle washer and everything under the sun. Uh, and Rob, well, I don't know what to say about you. I think I've said enough at this meeting already. Thank you. Yeah, I think enough enough, enough said, and I hope to yeah. see all of you in at, when I'm emeritus occasionally. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Um, so I I will so I will send out um, when Kent emails me. I probably have the original link to that documentation or his presentation. But Kent, could you please send me a fresh? Yeah, a I did that link? already. Okay, perfect. And then I will share that with the commissioners and uh, members of the public. Um, Jackie, I have Jackie. Jackie, could you, Jacqueline, excuse me, could you send me your email address, please? Um, and I have other, I have, I think everyone else's email address already. Um, and I'll forward that out. Thank you. Uh, and then I will send along an agenda. Um, for Friday's meeting uh, tomorrow morning. That's already been posted, so we're good to go. Uh, I apologize about the public meeting link issue that some people had. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it got dumped in, in the transference of the document from one computer or one email to another email, so I'm not sure. So, but Karen, 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 it's a Jack, it's a good thing Jackie balances around and keep me on my feet, so. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add or discuss? Oh, I'll just give uh, a quick update on something. Um, Jen and I had a meeting at Forbes Library about um, spotted lanternfly education. We were the only ones there. Nobody from the public showed up. Um, but we um, there's a bunch of follow-up work that I need to do, including uh, the first thing I have to call MDAR. Um, a specific person there to ask them some questions about how best can we make use of our volunteer people that we have, um, since like a lot of other cities don't have that opportunity. Um, so I'm going to talk to her and then um, I forget, I've got a little task list of things to do, but um, 
we're working on it. We're, we want to give away. We have information to give away at Arbor Day um, at the whip giveaway. I, I ordered some uh, brochures from MDAR about spotted lanternflies. So we'll be giving those to you. And also we want to do a little training of the people that are going to be at the whip giveaway uh, so they can answer questions about spotted lanternfly. Excellent. I like that. I, I thank you for the minutes. I did get them. I I didn't have a chance to read them, but I will read them, and then we'll get them in some meeting where we you you both of you can vote on them, and I can we can get them posted. I'm sure they're fine. Uh, but that's great. I also wanted to mention too that we may be having uh, another community partner. Um, the Energy Sustainability Commission is uh, starting a pilot program um, about talking about pollinator uh, pollinator plantings throughout the city and maybe they might be giving away um, free um, seed packets of uh, starter kits for um, pollinators for people to pollen do some pollination in their own property so I, I still have to follow up with that I was in conversation with Sue about it because Sue is, usually manages the uh, whip giveaway at the table and etc so I think we will have enough room and hopefully we can partner up with them a little bit. Uh, Jen. I just have to get off right at yeah, six. Yeah, we're, we're all, I'm all done. Okay. Anyone else have any business? All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Sue? I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Rob, second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, just raise your hands. Anyone not in favor, raise your hand. All right. Meeting is adjourned.